Good morning. Thank you for joining us. On behalf of the Griffiths Institute, the MITRE Corporation, and the Enviro Advancement Center, welcome you to today's GI Lecture and Education Series on Quantum. I am Mike Wesley from the Griffiths Institute, and today's guest speaker is Joe Klappis from MITRE Corporation. Joe is a lead software system engineer at the MITRE Corporation. He has over 10 years experience in a variety of software domains from which vision to virtuality and now currently works on quantum software systems. His latest research involves bridging the gap between quantum algorithm theories and their practical implementations and developing educational methods to bolster the quantum software workforce. Joe, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start sharing here and get some things set up. Okay. The chat's perfect. Does everything look okay? Looks very good. Outstanding. So good morning, everybody, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, before we begin, I just wanted to say thank you again to the Innovari Advancement Center and the folks at the Griffiths Institute for helping me host this talk. Uh, as you mentioned, my name is Joe Klappis, and I am a software systems engineering lead with the MITRE Corporation, which manages a collection of federally funded research and development centers. And my job uh, tends to revolve around designing and integrating the software that interfaces with larger overall systems. So during my tenure here, which has been about 11 years now, I've been involved in a whole host of projects from computer vision and human gesture recognition to uh, spacecraft orbit simulation. And about three years ago, I found myself working on uh, software systems for quantum computers. Now, quantum computing is a fairly hot topic these days, and it is well known for being somewhat arcane, uh, but I promise that you're not going to need to have any special background knowledge on it as part of this talk. I'm going to keep things nice and high level so everybody will get something out of it. I uh, understand that there are some people in the audience that are very well seasoned and experienced in this field, but there are, will be some people who are fairly new to it as well, so for the sake of engagement, I'm going to keep things high level here. Uh, what I would like to share with you today is the story of how our quantum software group came to be, uh, what kind of work we do in it, and our lessons learned as we begin to explore the future of this whole space. Uh, I'm planning to uh, go through about 40 minutes or so of presentation, and I'll leave lots of uh, time for questions at the end in case anything interesting comes up that you'd like to learn more about during this talk. Okay, so to be clear, uh, quantum computing itself isn't a new area of interest for MITRE. We have had experts involved in the overall space for quite a long time, but what I'm going to specifically talk about today is the quantum software group within MITRE. Now, our work tends to revolve around three key activities these days. Uh, first off, we collect novel quantum algorithms from peer-reviewed sources or journals and conferences, uh, and the algorithms that we collect look like they may be applicable to our interests. So what you see here is a sample from our repository. Uh, we capture what a particular paper represents, uh, what its use cases are for the algorithm it contained inside, uh, what the potential speed up could be versus uh, classical computation, and then we provide links for it as well. The second thing we do is we take those algorithms uh, and we try to implement them in software using a variety of different uh, frameworks and tools. This is gonna produce some assembly code that drives a quantum computer, much like a conventional program compiles down into classical machine code for a regular computer. It's the same kind of idea here. We study this compiled quantum assembly uh, that uh, the algorithms produce, and we make sure that it is correct so our implementation does what it's supposed to do. Uh, we check its efficiency to make sure it actually matches uh, the prescribed runtime or complexity that's purported in its original paper. And then we look and see how it compares from a perfect simulation world to a real hardware execution world and where the gotchas are, where essentially the uh, resource requirements, the performance and that kind of thing. And then the third thing we do is we educate both students and engineers alike to help make this whole realm of quantum software engineering uh, more accessible to audiences that aren't necessarily familiar with it and would like to get into it. 
So to explain to you these three activities, I think it's best if I start with the story of how we got here in the first place. Now, back in 2017, uh, there were a few of us that noticed a kind of trend in the industry. Uh, there were quite a few large companies and small startups alike that announced various software kits for interacting with quantum computers. Uh, so here you can see a couple of snippets that I went back in time to find, and these were announcements from IBM, uh, from Microsoft, and from a smaller company called Vergetti, all announcing that they had these new software capabilities for interacting with quantum computers. And in 2018, we saw Google AI announce a similar offering along with Honeywell and QCWare and a lot of other big names. And at the time, uh, there wasn't a quantum software engineering group here. There were just a few of us that uh, were curious about these developments and why things looked like they were ramping up the, the way they were within the industry. And that continued growth from 2017 into 2018 showed us that this was actually a real trend uh, and it's something that we needed to pay attention to and learn a little bit more about. So after some investigation, uh, we noticed that these companies were all building what are called general purpose quantum computers or universal quantum computers in-house. And these are essentially machines that can run an arbitrary quantum program. doesn't matter what it is. It can be just about anything. Some of them were also developing the software necessary to interact with said computer that they were hosting on premises. The idea was you would uh, write a program with this framework that any given company was making, and then you would submit that program as a job to their cloud service. And they would take it, they would run it on their machines, uh, and then pass you the results back once the execution had finished. So as a software engineering group, our first question was quite simple. What's the difference between all of these various offerings, these various software development kits? Uh, and what's the difference between the machines behind them? You know, which one is best suited for a given kind of work? What are the pros and cons of each? What are the strengths and weaknesses of each? That sort of stuff. So we started this process uh, just with a cursory little exploration uh, by enumerating the options that were out there. And we came across this publicly available list of said tools maintained by the Quantum Open Source Foundation, which I've linked at the bottom here. It has evolved a lot since 2018, uh, but this is a snapshot of what it looked like at the time when we started doing this exploration. Now, the list that they maintain contains a whole lot of different tools, uh, but we were specifically interested in the kinds of frameworks that I just described. Uh, those the Quantum Open Source Foundation calls full stack libraries. That is uh, something that includes a way to create a high level program for a quantum computer a compiler that can produce low-level machine code from your high-level program, a quantum simulator that runs the machine code either locally uh, or possibly on the cloud with a more powerful computer, uh, some kind of integration into an existing software setup, uh, a development setup specifically, uh, so some kind of integration into an integrated development environment, for example, which would provide code completion as you were writing, uh, and debugging supports as you're experimenting and testing the algorithm. Most of them include some way to submit jobs to the cloud for execution on the real quantum computers that these vendors provide. And then finally, they usually tend to provide analysis tools for exploring the results of execution of the algorithms. Now from this list, three of the frameworks were not for the kind of general purpose quantum computers that we were interested in. Uh, so we limited our exploration to the six that you see here, to XAC, CERC, Forest, Project Q, Qiskit, and Q Sharp, also known as QDK. The idea of this exploration was very simple. We started by taking some well-known, well-studied quantum algorithms, and then we implemented each of those algorithms in each framework. This involved both writing the code for the algorithm uh, and writing unit tests to verify that the code worked correctly. And during this process, we thoroughly documented our experience working with each one. We put together four different categories of criteria that you can see here. And then inside each category are lots of individual metrics. Uh, and we tried to assess all of the frameworks on each of those individual metrics. And as we went, 
we directly compared these metrics across each of the frameworks to kind of weight which ones uh, were better or worse in those certain categories. So we highlighted the relative strengths and weaknesses, essentially. Uh, and we came up with some notable kind of recommendations for use cases based on those strengths. Now, all of this work, uh, including the algorithm implementations and the unit tests, is all publicly available on GitHub. It's at the link that you see here, uh, github.com slash jclapis slash qsfe, that's the quantum software framework evaluation. So you are welcome to go over there and take a look at our exploration. Uh, here's a quick excerpt from our repository that shows a couple of code samples from different frameworks. Now, each framework stems from the same core theory, ultimately. So the differences between them are largely just semantic. Essentially, how does a framework represent a quantum program? How does it represent a quantum operation uh, for that program, like a single kind of instruction that it would include? How do you set up a program? How do you run it? That sort of thing. Uh, the theory is all pretty much the same. So on the left side, we have Q-sharp. Uh, that's Microsoft's domain-specific language for quantum computing. In the top right is Forest, and that's a framework maintained by Rigetti that uses Python to build quantum programs. And then at the bottom right is Qiskit, which is IBM's software framework, which also uses Python. Each theory of these examples does the exact same thing. Uh, the only difference is basically how they are put together and kind of how, how the program is represented within them. So we performed this analysis through 2018 and through 2019, uh, and the analysis culminated in a final report that described our findings and our recommendations for each of the frameworks. And I've extracted two of the more colorful artifacts from that here. Now, I wanna point out that these are quite old, right? These uh, were from 2019, which is an ancient history in software terms. Uh, but I left them here for reference so you could see kind of a snapshot of what this looked like at the time that we did the exploration. Things have certainly changed since then. But on the left, you can see the release history for new versions of each of the frameworks. And take a look at the differences here. You can see that uh, Qiskit, which is IBM's framework in blue, and Forest, which is Rigetti's framework in yellow, uh, they tend to have very frequent releases. Uh, these releases can contain new features. They can contain bug fixes. Essentially, these guys were very in tune with their communities, understanding what people were asking for, the kinds of problems people were having, and they very regularly released patches or updates with those things in place. In some cases, they release multiple per week. Microsoft, on the other hand, uh, is this orange one down here, and it took a bit more of a relaxed cadence, as is traditional with them. Uh, they offered slower releases, but they tended to be larger, so they kind of rolled up bug fixes and new features into maybe uh, monthly releases is generally what we saw. And then finally, Google's framework Cirque is in gray here, and Project Q, which is one that came out of academia, uh, they have a much slower kind of cadence. Project Q started off fairly well, but it's kind of slowed down since then. Uh, and these, at the time, again, back in 2019, would have releases every three months or so. So they were much more uh, concentrated and, and disparate. And then the last framework that I assessed, XAC doesn't actually do releases, like formal release versions. It's just kind of a constant rolling release process. And on the right is a little bit of a chiclet chart uh, that is a comparison of our scores for each of the frameworks on each of the criteria that we assessed. Now, a lot of this stuff is subjective. And again, this was based on our own personal development experience as we played with these uh, frameworks. So take them with a bit of a grain of salt. But in general, this captured our findings. And again, a lot's changed since then. Everything has uh, matured quite a bit in, over the last two years. But at the time, this is what we were looking at. So at this point, we had our little reports. And we had some good insights into the different quantum software frameworks that were out there. And the next log logical question was, we know what tools we have, we know what they can do, so what can we build with these tools? Uh, we had done this for well-studied algorithms throughout this process, but they had already been explored quite thoroughly uh, throughout the history of those algorithms. And we wanted to know what else is out there waiting to be applied to some interesting use cases. So we started answering that uh, in late 2019 and early 2020, 
uh, by assembling a corpus of algorithms with particular emphasis on practical use cases. That's one of the things that we keyed on. And granted, uh, powerful hardware isn't really available yet to take advantage of these, uh, but this still lets us prepare so that we can leverage the hardware for practical usage once it is available, rather than just having the machine and then playing catch up after the fact. Uh, and furthermore, this helps us kind of understand what would be required uh, from a hardware perspective for each of these algorithms in the first place. So our collection was inspired by a website called the Quantum Algorithm Zoo uh, that tracks hundreds and hundreds of different algorithms. I think it's at 430 right now. Uh, but our corpus is a little more focused on ones that directly present both the theory of a, an algorithm and its actual applications as well, provide some actual use cases. So there's a small excerpt of it in the screenshot here. We currently have about 100 algorithms, just slightly under that in our corpus. Uh, and again, each of these was published in some reputable peer review journal over the last six years. The idea is we basically collect things from a pretty wide gamut of domains. We have things from machine learning, optimization, uh, quantum chemistry and materials science, cryptography, data forensics, image processing. We even have a couple entries on risk analysis and finance in there. And then for each one, we look at the offered use case. We look at what kind of speed up the algorithm provides over its uh, classical competitors on regular computers. And specifically, we look at uh, what kind of quantum subroutines the algorithm uses in order to achieve that speed up. So there tend to be some very common kind of building blocks in these quantum algorithms that they all sit on top of. So studying those building blocks can tell you a lot about what the algorithm itself is capable of and what its requirements will be. Anyway, uh, the idea was that we could take these algorithms and we could run them through the same process as our test ones that we did during the framework evaluation earlier. We implement them in code. We confirm the code is correct via some unit tests. Uh, and then we compare their outputs and their performance with what the theory claims in order to find any inconsistencies in between them. So right away, we ran into a problem doing this. Uh, many quantum algorithms in academic kind of peer reviewed literature are presented in this format. So here is one such. Here's another example. This one is uh, definitely heavy on the math. And here's a third that I would submit is probably just as heavy, if not heavier. But basically quantum algorithms are kind of presented in this step-by-step -step format, where each step presents what's called the Dirac notation uh, for the total state of the system. And essentially this describes what a step does, but not necessarily how to do it in terms of quantum software instructions, in, in terms of machine code. Now, in some cases there is English verbiage that accompanies the steps and it is enough to figure out how to do it. Uh, but in other cases, the English verbiage is still a bit uh, too high level and doesn't really accurately capture what's really involved in making that algorithm work. And furthermore, what we found is that uh, mathematicians tend to have different dialects, if you will, uh, differences in conventions they use and the styles of their symbology. Uh, and that, that variation can cause ambiguity and inconsistency from paper to paper as you read them. Aggregated together, uh, we call all of these things essentially the paper problem. And a lot of our group's research is directed at tackling and minimizing this problem via better software tooling. And I'll talk a little bit about this as I go on. But uh, not all papers suffer from this problem. So some of them are actually quite good at laying out both the theory and the high level implementation of the algorithm. And those papers are the ones that we can really apply our test process to. So this is a good example of one. Uh, this is a quantum pattern recognition method for improving pairwise sequence alignment from Nature Scientific Reports back in 2019. Uh, this algorithm provides a way to use a quantum computer to determine the optimal relative positions of two sequences of data. So the idea is you've got these two essentially arrays of classical data, and this algorithm is going to find the relative offsets of the two of them that makes the most of their entries line up so that at any given index, the two arrays have the same value. 
this is kind of like figuring out how to align these two uh, reference or these two arrays essentially as optimally as possible. This has a lot of use cases. Uh, this ranges from genetic matching to comparison of voice samples. Basically anything where you have a known sequence and an unknown sequence, and you want to see how closely they match up together. That's what we're talking about. So here's a table from that paper. Uh, the left columns here, the first four, show the performance of existing methods on conventional computers. And then this right column shows the performance of the proposed quantum method uh, and the metrics were all kind of gathered by simulation. So they have proposed this thing, they've simulated the results, I believe, using MATLAB, and this is what they came up with. Now, according to this table, the proposed method has a better accuracy than the conventional ones, and it's two orders of magnitude faster. That is a significant finding, uh, and one that we really wanted to try to replicate using the software frameworks in our arsenal. So we saw this and we said, uh, could we basically prove that this actually works as expected? Could we build and test this? Okay, so let's actually build it. Uh, here's a picture that is straight from the paper. This is what's called a quantum circuit diagram. And this is a graphical representation of all of the quantum operations you need to execute step by step. This is a picture of the whole program. The horizontal lines that you see here, this first one, and then the second one, and then finally this third one, these horizontal lines uh, represent individual variables in the system. Those are called registers. And each rectangle, like this one with an H and an H here and a BB and a QFT, these rectangles represent a single operation that can apply to one or more of those variables. The operations are organized in vertical columns. Uh, so these are the different steps in the program, effectively. These are like sequential time steps from left to right. So you would execute these guys first, then you would execute this guy, and then it looks like these can probably be done in parallel, and then finally this one. Now the first step here uh, applies what's called the H operation, or the Hadamard gates. Uh, that's easy. We can do this one, no problem. Every quantum framework that we've tried comes with a built-in Hadamard gate. It's just a simple software call. So there's nothing special about that. Let's take a look at this third step here with the QFT. Uh, QFT stands for Quantum Fourier Transform. And that one's easy too. I actually have an implementation of the Quantum Fourier Transform uh, in each of the frameworks we've played with inside that framework evaluation repository that I mentioned earlier. So this one isn't particularly scary. This last step here looks like an analog meter, uh, and this is a quantum measurement where we actually take a look at the machine and we get some output out of it. So all of the frameworks provide the capability for measuring quantum variables, quantum registers, and so this one is easy as well. This is the one that's not. And there's this thing. Uh, so the BB here stands for black box. And black box means we don't know how this works, we just know what it does. And from a software perspective, that's kind of a non-starter for us. Now the paper gets around this by assuming that you are running on a special device that can do the black box for you. In particular, a lattice plane surface made by nonlinear Kerr media. Uh, we are not using that device. We are using a plain old general purpose cloud-based quantum computing machine. Uh, so the question is, can we still do this if we don't have that special device? Can we actually run this whole thing? So we spent a month or so analyzing the nature of this black box, and we actually came up with a way to do it on a general purpose quantum computer. Uh, this green box here is our implementation for uh, that original black box. From an operations perspective, this is made entirely of things that a general purpose quantum computer can support. So this should work. Uh, and this paper that we have describing this in our finding is up on archive. I've uh, provided it like a DOI here if anybody wants to take a look at it. But anyway, uh, we call this quantum, we, so we call the subroutine the quantum dot plot because the black box is used to generate an image from the original two data sets called the dot plot. And this is an explicit way to generate the dot plot with the quantum computer. Now, importantly, uh, QDP here leverages something called NEQR as a subroutine. 
This stands for the Novel Enhanced Quantum Representation of Images. It was originally designed for images, but we found that it's really, uh, it can be applied to any arbitrary data. It's essentially a way to encode arbitrary data into a, the quantum analog of a dictionary or a hash map, if you will. Uh, it uses exponentially less memory than a conventional uh, array does, and so it can be processed exponentially faster, but there's a catch. Uh, with NEQR right now, it takes exponentially long to actually do this encoding in the first place. So for the input size, every single bit you add to the input size, it takes twice as long to run that step. Nevertheless, because we can actually build the whole thing out with instructions that are compatible on a real quantum computer, we ended up doing that and assessing our assembly anyways. We ran it through our whole test process. Basically, we could finally implement this thing and give it a shot to see what its uh, performance requirements would look like. And so what you're looking at here are some representative different runs using both Microsoft's QDK uh, and IBM's Qiskit frameworks on a variety of different backends, some of which are perfect simulators and some of which are real quantum computers. So there's a couple of things to note here. Uh, first off, our quantum dot plot is extremely efficient uh, in terms of the number of operations that it requires as the input size increases. The quantum Fourier transform is also quite efficient, although it is one or two orders of magnitude more expensive depending on the particular topology you're looking at. And then there's this, the NEQR portion. This is the, the classical data encoding portion. Uh, this is extraordinarily inefficient and it completely dwarfs the rest of the program. Like everything is, is trivial compared to this step. Uh, it is so inefficient that in some cases, as you see here, it took several hours just to compile the assembly for the program in the first place. There's another one down here that does the same thing. And this, this compilation time is going to eradicate any kind of quantum speed up that the algorithm would otherwise provide, which is an interesting kind of quirk of the whole thing that you don't get just by looking at the theory. And you can only get by doing this practicality assessment. But at the end of the day, what this tells us is, unfortunately, the algorithm isn't something we can take advantage of without the specialized hardware that the original paper mentions. Now, this isn't always obvious uh, to entities or to individuals that are interested in that use case. So this kind of analysis can be pretty eye-opening when you actually do it and see the real results. Now, QDP is just one example of the kinds of experiments that my group has done. And after we've gone through several rounds of this process, these are our two main takeaways. First off, understanding the quantum paradigm is difficult for conventional engineers, specifically for engineers that are well-versed in uh, classical software engineering, but not necessarily well-versed in the, the quantum landscape of things. When you come from a, a classical software background, it takes a lot of practice and a lot of time and elbow grease to really get used to and digest the concepts that are involved in quantum computing. And then second, deriving the code from the theory requires a lot of experience. Basically the process of transcribing uh, an algorithm from an academic paper into working executable code is a hard thing to do. And these two are the motivating principles behind most of our group's research today. So I wanna talk a little bit about how we're tackling both of these things. So the first problem, uh, quantum is difficult for conventional software engineers. We started by asking ourselves the following question, knowing what we know now, and uh, if we had the opportunity to go back in time, how would we fast track our old selves? How would we train ourselves with the concepts and the tools and the lessons learned and kind of the gotchas and caveats of this whole space. To answer this, uh, we compiled a collection of techniques, of analogies, of general lessons learned from our past work and all that kind of stuff. And we created a class out of it. The class started small at first. It was a simple two-day program uh, that we taught in-house to give interested engineers a brief introduction into the world. And now, uh, it has evolved into a very comprehensive class that can span a few weeks to an entire semester, depending on the needs of the audience. Uh, the class is built with a very modular structure, which you see here. Each topic starts with a lecture, and then it's followed by a series of hands-on programming exercises, programming labs, 
uh, that help the students kind of grasp the concepts. They all have multiple problems. They start very easy and they progressively get harder to ensure that they really get the idea. But the whole thing is open source. It's all publicly available. Uh, you can go to the link you see here, stem.miter.org slash quantum, if you want to see that lecture material live. Uh, we also host the labs up on GitHub as well. Uh, the answers to the labs are not on GitHub. Those are private and our, uh, the presentation material we use to kind of do our actual lectures is not hosted as well. So if you're interested in learning more about the class or you'd like to see that material, uh, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to share. So this is a quick excerpt from one of those lectures. Uh, this is an introduction to the notion of a quantum bit, also known as a qubit. It is the proverbial unit of information in a quantum computer. And we use uh, complex numbers as kind of an analogy to help understand the different states that a qubit could be in. This is an example for one of the programming exercises that accompanies this uh, lecture. Each one of these exercises is an incomplete function with lots and lots of documentation on what is expected, what the students have to do in order to actually uh, succeed with this exercise. So the students need to convert those expectations into the code that you see here, which is just fail, not implement it. This is in uh, Q Sharp. We, we also have uh, tests in uh, Qiskit as well, in Python. So we, we have both flavors because again, translating back and forth between the frameworks isn't particularly difficult since they all stem from the same core theory. It's just about the semantics of how it's applied. But once the, the student finishes uh, one of these exercises, they can verify it uh, by running an associated unit test, or in some cases, a suite of tests uh, that ensure the implementation is correct. And before moving on, I really want to give credit to Microsoft uh, for their quantum katas repository on GitHub that they openly maintain, another um, freely available open source resource uh, for people who are kind of learning quantum. Uh, that repository served as a major inspiration to us back in 2018 and 2019 when we started structuring our own uh, class and exercises. Now, the intent behind the class is to teach quantum computing and uh, specifically quantum software to classically trained software engineers. We knew it worked in-house uh, well enough because we've run this multiple times, but to really stress test this, we ran a program with MIT Lincoln Labs' Beaverworks Summer Institute this past July, a few months ago. The student body was 28 high school students from around the country. So not college, high school students, varying from freshmen all the way up to senior. And the students started with no real knowledge of quantum computing, but they did have some basic programming knowledge. So part of the prerequisites for this was uh, they have to take an introduction to Python to help them kind of get a feel for how the software development process and pipeline works and things. Our class was four weeks long. It was the entire month of July. It was seven hours a day, five days a week, the entire thing was virtual. So it was all hosted online. The first two weeks of the class, we spent going through the lectures and the exercises, like I just showed you. We covered the fundamentals, then we covered applications and algorithms, uh, and then finally execution on real cloud-based quantum computers that were provided by IBM. Uh, the students got to see the differences between what a simulator with perfect qubits could do and what the hardware with imperfect or real world qubits could do. And they got to gain a real appreciation for where the hardware is in terms of its capability and its maturity right now. Then the second two weeks were spent working on group projects. Uh, the students got together into teams of three or four and they picked an academic paper, which is the kind that you saw earlier in this presentation, some of which can be pretty esoteric, but they were able to digest that paper implement it, study it, and then report on their findings about running it and how the, the real practicality compared to the theory. Those reports are all captured in video form on YouTube. Each of the students basically created uh, five to 10 minute videos that describe the algorithm, how they built it, their analysis of running it for real in the comparison with the theory. And they end with some lessons learned of their own on what they found challenging about the exercise and what the uh, insights they glean from it. If anyone is interested in seeing those, I can provide some YouTube links for you as well, so you can check them out. 
but all of the students, uh, they surpassed our wildest expectations in this process. We were, since this was our first time teaching it uh, outside of Meyer, we weren't really sure how it was going to go and whether or not they would actually be able to apply what they learned in the class to the real world. Uh, and they did an incredible job demonstrating exactly that. Uh, they grasped the material, they put, they digested those papers, they built the, the, so the software source code, uh, they ran it, they tested it, they analyzed it, everything we had asked them to do. It was uh, very encouraging to see. So we, we know based on their performance that uh, this can help fast track existing talent. And so we're starting to look at expanding this out into larger audiences now. And the second problem I mentioned was uh, deriving code from theory tends to require significant experience or driving code from papers. Now, when we're not busy teaching intro to quantum software, my team spends most of our time solving this problem. It really, the problem is kind of the gap between uh, what's provided with paper authors and researchers and what's needed by software engineers. So ideally the pipeline would look like this. You'd start with a state vector like you see here and some associated verbiage around it. Uh, you translate that into some kind of form that describes not only what the system is doing, but how to accomplish it. Uh, so a quantum circuit diagram is a pretty standard way to do exactly this. It's pretty readily available as well. Then you take that circuit diagram and you'd derive code from it. So you'd actually have someone sit down, look at that picture and build out some assembly, some, some quantum source for you. Uh, and then that quantum source would get translated into machine instructions, which you could then run on a quantum computer and get the results back. This last step here, uh, this is largely the purview of compilers. It's very rare for people to do this by hand nowadays. We prefer to write in the higher level software languages that are out there and let the compilers for those software frameworks uh, help us build the assembly. Uh, this second step here is the purview of software engineers. And this is where the classical training that I just mentioned comes in. It's basically being able to understand what this picture is trying to tell you and write code to perform it. The first step is kind of the hard part. Ideally, this would be provided by the authors of the paper that have a very intimate understanding of the algorithm that they are presenting in the first place. Uh, but this isn't always the case. Sometimes you'll see papers that focus almost exclusively on the state vector notation, and they don't really provide any semblance of a circuit diagram or any other way of uh, helping an engineer understand how to build this algorithm, how to actually go and run it and execute it for practical purposes. So what my team tends to work on these days is a software tool that can help take this direct notation and divine the how from the what and effectively produce a, something analogous to the circuit diagram. The goal is to take the guesswork out of all of this and convert it into a form that's readily available for implementation. Uh, we will definitely have more to share on this front as our research matures. It's looking good right now, uh, but we're not ready to present anything out to the world quite yet. But if you are interested in the topic, uh, stay tuned, and we will definitely have something pretty soon to share with you. And then finally, coming back to the original question of how would we fast track ourselves if we could go back in time? I mentioned that one of the things we would do is share some lessons learned with our former selves, and I thought it would be useful if I tried to distill some of those key lessons learned here. So number one, use the right tool for the job. There are a lot of tools out there. Some of them are better at simulating than others. Some offer a better debugging experience than others. Some are better at assessing the characteristics of real quantum computers better than others. There is no single universal best framework for everything. Uh, so we recommend that you learn to use lots of them. They all stem from the same theory. Translating back and forth is uh, quite easy. It's just a matter of knowing the semantics, but the more tools you have in your tool belt, the better off you'll be. Number two, understanding why a particular algorithm is useful in the first place. Now having an algorithm itself is fine, but they don't do anything in a vacuum. You really have to understand the use cases that they support, and you have to answer, you know, what would you do with this thing? Uh, is it really that important? Would you 
does, does it solve a real world problem that you have today? That kind of thing. If not, is it worth your time even investigating this? Basically, you want to filter things down by what's relevant to you and prioritize accordingly. And you'll find that you can ignore a lot of the noise that way. Number three, uh, when you do find a paper or an algorithm, you want to look for assumptions, omissions, and abstractions that prevent you from building and testing it. Now, there are a lot of papers out there that do true or that claim to do truly miraculous things with quantum computers. And you need to check these papers for any kind of assumptions that they make, any omissions they left out, or any abstractions that prevent you from using it for practical purposes, prevent you from really applying it. These are often really hard to find. Sometimes they're only mentioned in a footnote, or sometimes they're only mentioned in little blurbs in the conclusions, uh, but they can make or break an algorithm's actual usage. So you have to be very careful when you're looking at a paper to understand exactly what it thinks that you have available on hand, because you might not. Number four, connect with experts that can provide access to hardware. This is a big lesson learned that I wish I could go back in time and tell myself early on. Running things on a simulator is helpful for verifying the correctness of the code, but it really doesn't provide a realistic picture for what an algorithm will do on a real machine or what it will require. For that, you need a real machine and all of the good ones, so to speak, are generally not available to the public. Many of them are available if you subscribe to various partnership programs or research affiliate programs or anything like that with the vendors. So we do recommend you get into such programs. And as the saying goes, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And finally, help your colleagues when they get stuck was another good lesson learned for us. And this really isn't an insight that's specific to quantum software engineering. Uh, but I think it is especially applicable to this domain. Even when you've been doing this for years, it is still challenging and we all make mistakes. And so I encourage you to work with your colleagues. And if they're frustrated on a problem, uh, offer a second set of eyes and use all of the whiteboard space you have available when necessary. I cannot recommend enough investing in a really good whiteboard if you're going to get into the space. Before I close, I want to talk briefly about where we expect things to go in the future based on our observations, uh, and then I'll open it up for some questions. We predicted back in 2019 that uh, quantum software tooling would remain public and open source, and that hardware would remain largely cloud-based with strict licensing agreements and scheduling kind of governing as usage. And this has largely been proven true in the last two years. In fact, there are now at least five of these setups, which I showed here. Microsoft has Azure Quantum for cloud-based services, which you use via their QDK. Uh, IBM has their IBM Q machines, some of which are public, most of which are not. Uh, and you use Qiskit to access their software platform. Rigetti has a private quantum cloud service, which you can access via their Forest Kit. Google follows a similar path, a, quantum, a, a private uh, quantum cloud service, which you can access with their CERC framework. And then even Amazon has a quantum cloud service available that they call Brackets, which you can use, um, which you can leverage with their toolkit that they provide. And we expect that uh, things are going to continue in this fashion for the foreseeable future, because right now hardware is still quite cumbersome and it's expensive to maintain, and it's really best situated in dedicated facilities. So similarly, the software side of things, the frameworks have way too much momentum behind them right now to be changed effectively. The open source paradigm has pretty much outclassed all but the most powerful of proprietary offerings. So it is our suspicion that uh, this will continue and investing in any of those aforementioned frameworks that I mentioned are gonna be pretty much future-proof. So there, there shouldn't be a concern about learning the wrong framework or uh, kind of being obsolete by spending all this training time on the wrong framework really it's more about the fundamentals and then learning the, the different frameworks. It's just a matter of application and semantics. So any of them should be okay. And then with respect to tooling and algorithms, we've seen a pretty substantial number of papers recently that rely on having an efficient method of encoding classical information into the quantum computer. So right now we don't have that capability, which kind of stops any of those algorithms from uh, working effectively. One of the solutions to this that we are very interested in is something called quantum RAM or QRAM for short. Uh, and I'm gonna keep a high level here, but we're hopeful that quantum RAM is going to let us take some classical data and convert it into a quantum representation 
that takes exponentially less storage, like any QR you saw before, uh, but can also do this in linear time instead of exponential time. So it gives you the best of both worlds. And that's where a lot of the algorithms will get their speed up from. This is kind of one of the major missing pieces in this whole landscape that we've seen so far. Uh, having this capability would unlock most of the algorithms uh, that play with cla existing classical data and can't just generate the classical data on the fly uh, on the quantum computer. So I mentioned the quantum algorithm zoo earlier, uh, and that's again referenced here, which you can actually see with a link to it. And if you ever get the chance to scroll through it, you'll see what I'm talking about. A lot of the algorithms in the zoo uh, rely on a capability to be able to efficiently encode classical data into the quantum computer in order to provide a practical advantage. And so based on this, our prediction is uh, this is going to be a very important area of development in the future once we have a better grasp on more robust, uh, long-lived kind of error-protected qubits. So we're going to start by evolving the qubits themselves, and then once we have sufficient qubit capacity, we can start looking at the, the quantum RAM side of things for storing classical data, and that's where a lot of these algorithms are going to get very interesting. So our eyes are pretty closely trained on this. Okay. And with that, I think that's a pretty good summary of the kind of work that the quantum software team does, uh, the motivating factors behind why we do it, and uh, what we're hopeful about in the future as far as our work program goes. And so with this, I'll open the floor to uh, questions from anybody. If anything looked particularly interesting or uh, strange to you, please go forth and uh, let me know. So one question I get, uh, oh, oh, sorry, let's see one here. Help colleague, another option I use is take a break or change direction. Okay, that's fair too. Uh, definitely one that I use quite regularly. Uh, if you kind of start banging your head against the wall and it doesn't look like you're making any progress or anything, uh, the, my first line of defense is to have one of my colleagues come over and take a look and see if what I'm trying to do makes sense or if there's a better way of doing it. Uh, but if said colleagues are unavailable or they're otherwise preoccupied, another thing that I tend to do is kind of switch over to a different task for a little bit, clear my mind, come back to it tomorrow, for example, uh, when I can look at the problem fresh and I'm not so tunnel visioned on whatever solution that I happen to have. I agree, that's definitely helpful. What about optical slash photonic quantum and architectures that can obviate the need for increased number of qubits to run quantum error correction? So I, I specifically didn't talk about uh, architectures and error correction in this because I'm trying to keep things high level for people that aren't familiar with them. Uh, but I will offer that my expertise is in the software domain. As I mentioned, I take a look at algorithms, I take a look at implementing the algorithms, and I try to find the uh, the practical use cases of those. When it comes to the hardware domain, there are certainly other more qualified engineers, both here and outside, uh, that can take a look at some of those things. I know that we have some interest in the optical side of things uh, in terms of uh, actually like building real machines and what the differences are between superconducting and trapped ion and photonics and that kind of stuff. So I will probably have to defer to their expertise. But if, if you ask me offline, I'm sure I can get you connected to some of them. Can you elaborate more about point four from the lessons learned? Yeah, let me take a step back and look at those lessons learned. There we go. Connect with experts that can provide access to hardware. Okay, so I can elaborate on this for a little bit. Uh, in the slide, let's see, where was it? Here it is, in this slide, I mentioned that there are a couple of vendors out there like these, these sort of high powered vendors, big businesses that have quantum computers that are developing quantum computers and they provide offerings. But most of them are kind of blocked off from the general public. As far as I know of these five, IBM is the only one that provides quantum computers that the general public can access uh, and experiment with. They provide a lot of quantum computers that the general public public can't access and experiment with, things that have many more qubits, things that are much more robust, things that provide a lot uh, higher fidelity and efficacy, but you can't touch them unless you are part of IBM's uh, Q network. 
uh, which means you have established a relationship with them as a research partner. You have a verified need for accessing their hardware and you have signed the appropriate agreements for getting access to said hardware. The same thing applies to the rest of these guys. So Azure Quantum that Microsoft offers, for example, uh, it is still a private offering. You have to sign up with them. You have to sort of state your intentions, your needs, and show that you are really going to leverage this cloud-based capability uh, for real legitimate research, and you have to sign some some agreements with them as well. So all of them are basically hidden behind uh, these agreements of you have to be a research partner, and they have to vet you, and they have to give you access to them. So what I meant by point number four was, uh, if you want to do real research on real machines, and you want to assess the, the sort of practicality in terms of what the real machines are capable of versus what the algorithm requires, you need to have access to those things, which means you either need to be a research partner uh, in one of those programs, or you need to know someone who is a research partner who can help you get access to those things. That's what I meant by point four. I hope that's helpful. One question I get a lot is how many people are in the group right now? Uh, there are, right now, there are four people that are in our quantum software group, and that is growing uh, as we uh, start to expand the work program and take a look at more of this stuff. Can I show the first slides? Sorry, do you want to lay? Yeah, I can go all the way back. It's going to take a little bit, but I can get there. Okay, so this is the slide for where we began just showing off some of the uh, announcements from various vendors back in 2017. And this is a slide showing our exploration of the frameworks that we decided to assess. Six of them in total. This is a snapshot of the criteria we used for assessing them. And we did this by uh, looking at existing well-known, well-studied algorithms and building those out in each of the software frameworks. And then this is a little bit about what our results were back in 2019 when we did this assessment of how we thought everything was. Any comments on quantum-inspired classical software algorithms? So I remember going to the Quantum Tech Congress in Boston back in 2019, and uh, Microsoft announced that they had done some very interesting things uh, with medical imaging. They had built a quantum-inspired algorithm that was something like uh, six times more accurate and 30% faster, or maybe I'm flipping those uh, particular metrics. But that was pretty inspirational for me at least. Uh, one of the things that I really enjoy doing is the practicality assessment side of things. Let me switch back to uh, a slide that shows that. Here we go, this one. I really enjoy doing this kind of thing where I get to take an idea and build it and test it and run it and benchmark it and see uh, what it's actually capable of in the real world. Uh, and so doing that for uh, quantum inspired algorithms is right up our real house as well. There aren't as many of them as there are uh, algorithms for actual quantum computers, but when they do come around, they are a lot of fun to play with. And I'm very excited that people are uh, taking the notion of how like a quantum simulator works and applying that to uh, real classical algorithms and boosting their progress. That's That's very cool to see. What are you doing to leverage existing algorithms to be reused in the quantum computer? So that depends entirely on uh, how those existing algorithms are implemented. If you mean taking existing source code uh, for those things and testing them out, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. So the pipeline we have right now starts with a paper and then it goes into an implementation of that paper. And then it comes to unit tests to verify that our implementation is correct. And it does what the paper expects it to do. And then we do the practicality assessment once we know that our implementation is correct. Uh, so in that case, if we already have existing source code, we just start at point number two. We write unit tests if they don't already exist to validate the correctness of the algorithm. 
And then we can go ahead and do some practicality assessments on it to determine uh, what it would actually require from a resource perspective. There have been a couple cases where we've done that. In one of them, I believe we found an error uh, with the original implementation. There was like a, a corner case that didn't quite apply right. We had to do a little bit to bolster it, but uh, for the most part, these things are already, if they're published in, in like a well-respected peer reviewed journal or something, uh, they're already pretty robust as is. Now, I should mention that that only works if we have software like an existing implementation for one of the frameworks that we've tested. Uh, so specifically for a quantum software framework, right? If you have a classical implementation that doesn't really get us anywhere from our, our practicality assessment. Is there an algorithm in Q software to address race conditions? That's a, an interesting, idea. Uh, I'll start by saying I'm not sure that race conditions really apply the same way uh, to a quantum computer. Generally, these are kind of monolithic machines that run one program at a time, and those programs are very specifically built as discrete kind of steps, like instances in time with specific operations. So from a race condition perspective, you'd have to have kind of competing steps. Like I'm thinking classically where you have like a data structure, for example, and you've got multiple threads accessing and changing state of that data structure at the same time. Uh, quantum computers are more parallel than multi-threading. Yeah, so that, that's more of like a fundamental kind of paradigm question. And I would encourage you to go take a look at some of our lecture material that I posted uh, earlier. Let me see if I can go to it again. Yeah, this website here uh, to, to kind of glean a better understanding of like what quantum computers are actually doing and why that, that question seems a little, I'm not sure if it applies here, basically. Awesome. All right, we've got a few minutes left, anything else? We have a comment from Richard Preston. So full disclosure, Richard is uh, my partner in crime, so to speak, he's one of the members of our quantum software engineering group as well. How can I stay in touch? That is a good question. Uh, we, the easiest way to do it would be via email. I believe our email is included in the, uh, the lecture or the, um, the presentation material, the, the announcement and things. Uh, but if not, I'll, I'll type it in chat here so you have it. Uh, there's my email address. And you can use that to, uh, to ask me about any further information or insight or anything, any developments that we have. I, I suspect uh, if this goes well, this may not be our uh, last kind of conference at the, the Griffiths Institute, although I'll leave it up to them. And we could potentially come back with another deep dive into uh, some of the other topics as well, like how the class is going or how our, um, our bridge between the algorithm side of things, that the paper side of things and the software side of things is going. All right, looks like that's about it. So before I hand it over again, I just wanna say thank you once again to the staff at the Yenavari Center and uh, the Griffiths Institute for helping us host this talk. I hope you guys found it enlightening and, uh, and interesting. And I'm looking forward to the, the follow-on from anybody that wants to learn more. So Joe, yeah, I found this uh, talk very late. You know, we, we will want to present more topics along the science, so we will keep in touch and, and come up with other uh, lecture series so that we can keep people informed. As you know, this is a very important uh, technology that we all can't solve singly, we need to solve together. So I thank you for your time and to, to give us the overview that you did give. Uh, I thank everybody else who was online to our attending event. Uh, the slides will be available and the presentation recording will be available on the GI website under the GI lecture and education series. Uh, if you don't can't find it there, you know, please uh, reach out to us and we'll, we'll point you to the right spot. Um, and I'd also like to thank you know the, the Griffiths Institute, Mitre Corporation, and the Environmental Advancement Center for uh, presenting this lecture to the community. And I hope you look forward to other uh, lecture community uh, series we have out there in the future. 
So with that, I'd like to close it. Joe, thank you very much. Thank you.